about. What is it about, Superman? It's whatever they want to Okay. <laughs> um, and Mike is now the moderator, because we only this seem to be just three of us Because right I'm now. the most moderate up here. That's <laughs> obvious. Uh, we, we think that there are some other people coming to be on the panel, too. But they also keep moving these rooms around, so they may never find it. <laughs> Even with all the help from the Boy Scouts of America. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, we worked on Superman about 20 years ago, and people still seem to want to ask us questions about it. And we make up new answers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm Mike Carlin. I was the editor on the Superman titles uh, from the late 80s to the mid 90s, and that was a fun thing to do. And next to me is Jerry Ordway, a writer and artist. Hello. <laughs> That's what an editor does. <laughs> and next to him is Louise Simonson. Hi. Who is a writer on Man of Steel. On uh, a pretty good era of the Superman titles. People still seem to like what happened, and that makes it really fun. It was also fun while we were doing it, most of the time. <laughs> Sometimes it was, sometimes it was work, <laughs> but it was mostly fun. The, when it became work was when we actually got more and more successful once the title started uh, and selling more and expanding. Uh, <clears throat> it, more and more things kind of reached on to what was going on in our books. Uh, there was a point where there was three Superman books and John Byrne was writing two of them and drawing two of them and Jerry was doing the third book. Then John Byrne decided he was done with his Superman ideas for the moment. Because he may come back, you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we, we were suddenly down to two books, and we put Roger Stern on one of the titles, and Jerry stayed on, on his. When it was two guys, it really was our bright idea to kind of link these comics a little closer together, and it was really easy with two guys who were doing it by themselves. Uh, and one of them happened to be drawing these comic too, so that was even better. So there's not that many people who drew me. <clears throat> As that got more successful, the third title came back, and Dan Jurgens joined our group. Then, for a couple of years, Paul Levitz kept bothering me where his fourth Superman book was going to be, and I was like, oh, man, if we do everything tied together, that's like a weekly comic book. And there hadn't been a weekly comic book. <laughs> there's Dan. Here comes some more there's famous Dan. people. Yeah, there's Dan now. And John Bonetto. And a real so moderator. Was there was a panel. You know, yeah. And a real moderator. Dan Jurgens is here. And John Bonetto and Crypto. <laughs> and Mitch Halleck, who's the moderator. Thank you very much. So send a microphone. I need somebody to do me a favor. I'm not the moderator anymore. <laughs> You've all had a good time, I suppose, right? You're the moderator for a long time. My cell phone just died. Uh -oh. so, so somebody give me a heads up before uh, you know, the, five, the last five minutes or so. I'm designating who. We're John Pappas. John Pappas, you are my guy. Okay. Give me five minutes heads up because my phone just died on the way up. Anyway, Carlin, what would you do? Tell him the secret of the universe? I told him that the real moderator was a real... <laughs> I don't need this. <laughs> anyway, can you hear me out there? Yeah. Okay, I don't need a mic. Yeah, yeah, that's that's right. All, right. Yeah. All right, we're here talking about I don't know, the birds and the bees. Ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about the death of Superman. It's been 20, how many years now? 2021? 20, 20, 21 years now? You could have been the legal age right now. You had a kid and you could have been drinking and driving and all that fun stuff. But anyway, I'm sure you've already introduced yourself. Ladies and gentlemen, the chairman of the board, the master of disaster on saxophone for the E Street Band, Mike Carlin. batting cleanup for the Detroit Pistons, or the Detroit Tigers, sorry, the Tigers. Jerry, I killed Superman, Ordway. And then of course, you know her, you love her, you can't live without her, don't call her Wheezy. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> And where's my shuttle Jurgens? That's an story. Uh, Don't call him Wheezy either. <laughs> and to my right, the one and only kid who's late. That's my left. Uh, John Bogdanov. Let's hear it for John. 
I don't know if you've been told about this, but there was a story called The Death of Superman. It wasn't a one-issue thing. It went on for a long time and even longer. We're going to find out why that was. But let's start. <laughs> let's start where they always start, in the beginning. John Byrne created the Man of Steel. I don't know if you want to go back that far, but what happens is from That's the not the way it happened. I know, I know. <laughs> There was once this little Doctor course. Oh, yeah, someone's going to take that. Yeah, no, 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 no. no, no. I mean, we just saw him a couple weeks ago on the state sale. But that's another story. The, uh, okay, DC had just relaunched Superman, Pal L, Clark Kent, whatever you want. Not too many years before the death of Superman came about. Now, what was going on behind the scenes that marketing, editorial, creative, somebody said, well, we just relaunched it, we rebooted it, we retinkered the whole thing. Just less than 10 years ago, less than seven or eight years ago, why do we have to do something drastic like oh, yes. this? Who was the first one to answer that? Nobody said that. No, <laughs> no, no, we just were doing our next story when we got to the death of Superman. Yeah. And if you've read comics uh, for any length of time, you know that the death of the hero story comes around every now and then. And in fact, had already happened to Superman in previous generations. So we were not asked to do it, we were not scared to do it. We had an out, we knew the ending, and uh, it really was, the, the miracle to me is that after this happened and, it, and the big success that it was, was that they didn't come to us and ask us to top it. They realized that it was an unusual thing. The marketing guys did not come up with this idea. This was just some guys in a room who wanted to tell a story. And we thought it was just the next adventure that Superman would hopefully survive. And uh, he didn't for a part of it, but then he did it ultimately. So, and he got better. <clears throat> and it, it, it kind of reminded people why they shouldn't take Superman for granted, which was our personal frustration in the writing room, which was that people were liking the Punisher and yeah. the Wolverine type murderer characters more than Superman, who we thought was a better role model. So we said, what, what would they think if he wasn't there? And that was the motivation. So it wasn't marketing guys. Well, I, I've seen documentary footage, they've done the DVDs and such, and you'll see that there's one guy in the back of the room that always raises his hand when they scratch and say, well, what can we do next? And Jerry, for some reason, has got death on his mind a lot. Like, Let's just kill him. Let's just kill him. Now, I mean, this didn't happen once or twice, according to legend. Did it finally say, okay, fine, let's do what Jerry says so he stops No, it, it, started with, it was a running gag, though. We had, because Mike would post up big charts that we have to fill in week by week for like six months worth of stories. And we couldn't go home until all the boxes were filled. That was, we couldn't have fun until we put something up on the wall either. So it was like we had to work at this thing. And it became kind of just a thing to fill in something to start the wall. Everyone dies at the end because that's the end of every story. Everyone dies at the end. So that, I think, is what came around as a kind of a gag, and then it was, hey, wait, we could do that. But at the, the way I remember it, um, you know, at the time we had just had a year of continuity worked out. Uh, we'd been in the conference room for I guess three days or something like this, and and we had worked out a year's worth of continuity uh, and. Uh, we were told at the end of it that we couldn't do that because it conflicted with with the story that was going to be happening in this new TV show, Lois and Clark. Oh, so that is the way you that's, remember. That's, it. The way that, that, that's just the way I remember. Yeah. I'm going to say the way it happened. Uh, so, <laughs> but the, the part of the story I want to we go now. The part of the story I want to get to that's is great. that this time when Jerry said, "Oh well, let's kill him," uh, Louise, who had um, been the editor of the X books over at Marvel and had presided over the death of many a hero and the return of some of them. Uh, said, you know what you get from killing your hero is you get a chance to show what he meant to everybody else in his universe. You get to show the reaction of the friends and the family and the enemies and the world at large what this character meant. And I think that appealed to a lot of us. Uh, now Michael tell you what really too. happened. Yeah. Now well, what really happened is that John Bogdanov <laughs> thought of everything. <laughs> no, it, oh, most of what you say is true. I just want everybody to understand, uh, as the, the term marketing gets thrown out, as the term TV series came and pushed our story out, 
basically we had planned to do Lois and Clark's wedding for Adventures number 500. And we were doing such a great job on the comics with the soap opera side of Lois and Clark's life that Hollywood got interested. And Jeanette Kahn, president of DC, and myself, we thought if they do a show, it would be better to get to the wedding down the road. So that if they do a wedding on the show, if it's that big a hit and they get to the wedding, we can do it together and actually mooch off of each other. Uh, that, I, that, I guess that's a marketing idea, but it wasn't from marketing people. <clears throat> the reality was, if the show bombed, we could just get to the wedding next year. You know, was, or you know, Superman comes back from the dead and it's like, oh my god, I died. Maybe I should get married because I <laughs> might not be alive next time I can get married. <clears throat> so we really thought all that stuff through and the show turned out to be an okay-ish hit. It lasted for four seasons. They did ultimately get to the wedding, but these guys were worried, what if I'm not on the books anymore? All the stuff that we figured out. What if Mike fires us? <laughs> <laughs> what if Mike got fired? <laughs> <clears throat> that could have happened. If the death of Superman didn't work, <laughs> that might have been my alternate future. Yeah. <laughs> but the re real reality was that the show worked. And then they did decide to do a wedding on the show. One of the problems was they didn't tell us until it was really close to happening. So we had all of our notes from the original plan for the wedding. And some people were really not around on the books anymore. Jerry was not around. But he came back to play on a few, you know, pages and scenes. We got as many people who've ever worked on Superman as there were still around to work on this uh, wedding issue. Kurt, Kurt was already Kurt Swan had, passed, had passed, away. passed away, but we had inventory stories that we took some pages out of mm -hmm. and put in as flashbacks in the story. So we got Kurt to be involved. In my estimation, for whatever reason, whether it was marketing or, you know, editorial or just it seemed like the right idea at the time, we got to do everything. We got to do the death of Superman. The, the reality is when you say, let's kill Superman, the next question to me was always, okay, then what happens? And when Wheezy and them came up with all the civilian stuff <clears throat> for the uh, funeral for a friend sequence, I was like, now we have to do this because it's re that's the story. The death of Superman is a fight scene, it's not a story. Funeral for a Friend was a, a thing. There's more to come for the reign of the Superman story, but I'll let other people talk. <laughs> well, I was gonna throw that out there, and maybe Louise can talk about this too. Now, we got the visual aspects from Jerry and from Dan and from John too. You have to come up with a villain that no one's ever seen before that could be a realistic threat to Superman. Honestly, something that could kill him. So I, I'm sure you had to go back and think, you know, physically, how are you going to draw this? How are you going to manifest this this creation of death that's coming his way? But from the writer aspect, and I'm going to throw it to Louise, were you thinking eventually down the road when what's going to happen to the characters? Like, the guys could draw fantastic battle scenes and such, but you have to put the written word in there to really impact the reader, because other than that, they're just flipping pages and looking like, you know, splash pages and big punches and all this stuff. What's going on as the writer, and how are you trying to make that emotional impact to the fans that they realize this is serious, this is the greatest hero we've ever had ever in comic history, and he might not be coming back, and how do you convey that to all these folks out there to read that so they, they, they get a sense of dread about it, that they think this might be legit, you know? Gee, I don't know. Um, you, you, you make it up, right? You write the best stories you can. You try to keep, you try to keep the emotions in the characters, the point of view of the characters, and what Superman meant to the different characters who were left behind, um, as real as you possibly can. I think that's, you know, that that's what the way you you get get any kind of emotional resonance with the readers. And honestly, you know, you can I, as a writer, I can write brilliant stuff, and if I don't get art that says that shows the emotion that I'm trying to put in the words, you've got something that's really flat. And we were really lucky to have, I was particularly lucky to have John Bogdanoff as my artist on the book, but all of the art in that book was just, it was everything, everybody was just, you know, working at up to 150%, 200% on those books. So it was really good. And part, part of also the behind the scenes thing here, and I'm gonna throw this now to Dan, because he was a big part of 
uh, pushing for the idea that we needed to do something that was a new villain that was bigger than Superman. We all agreed that for Superman to die and turn out to be Lex Luthor with a piece of kryptonite would have been about the worst thing we could have done. There's no kryptonite involved in the death of Superman story, which is a surprise to people. Everyone's like, oh, nothing can kill Superman except kryptonite. Well, we found something else. We made up something else. Did Wade hate that? I remember hearing yeah, A lot of people hate it. <laughs> <laughs> a, lot of people, a lot of people want what they think is an obvious idea, but if you gave it to them, they would reject it. Maybe not vocally, but also, but they just might, they might say, oh, well, that's what I thought would happen. Uh, we were also really lucky in that the internet wasn't quite as big a thing back then. So we, would, we just went with our guts. We, were, we didn't react to any outrage or whatever. And we managed to be able to tell our whole story, which was really great. And so Dan is the guy who wanted to make up a monster. Uh, one of the great, I think, uh, democratic things we did was during the conversation we had at the Death of Superman meeting, all four of the pencil artists designed their version of Doomsday. And everybody voted. And Dan's got picked. Right. And I, that doesn't happen it's in comics. Great design, too. And, and it's great. And now I can't even remember what the other guys look like. No, no. <laughs> Well, one of the things that had happened was um, I had wanted to do, the, the basic problem with Superman in a lot of ways in terms of his villains were too many of them wore business suits. Mm -hmm. Toy Man wore a suit, Lex Luthor wore a suit. I mean, you go down the list, Mr. Prankster wore a suit, Mr. Z wore a suit. And it's like, all I wanted to do was draw Superman hitting somebody. And he didn't have anybody he could really hit. And we were talking about different ideas. Originally, when we started talking about the death of Superman, I had said, I just want to do a monster that rips up Metropolis. That's, I just want to destroy Metropolis. And that was a, like a whole different idea. Right, but you had, and you had Superman 75 coming up on the charts. Right. And we said, all right, that's almost an anniversary. Yeah, anymore. and maybe maybe we can fuse the two ideas. And somehow. I just wrote Doomsday for Superman in that box to hold it. Yeah, yeah, right across the top, Mike wrote yeah. Doomsday for Superman. And I remember saying, is there anybody called Doomsday? Yeah. And I was like, we couldn't think of one. the guy who made up there Doomsday's is name. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's, and that's where I came from. <laughs> and it was, and the idea behind Doomsday was to just have and this is what we talked about in the room, was a force of nature, a bestial force of nature. Because every, in addition to having nothing but villains with suits, all of Superman's villains were really long-winded guys. <laughs> you know, and you, we had all these scenes where pages and pages of dialogue of Superman and his villains talking. And it was like, oh my God, does anyone know Superman can fly? He'd fly somewhere to go talk to a villain. And so this way we got to have a fight. I just wanted to have the fight. <laughs> and one of the things that, I don't think I've ever even talked about this, but uh, one of the great things was that Jeanette Kahn would come to these meetings and she watched everybody make up this uh, Death of Superman and monster story. And these guys were in a room and then I went to her office with her and I was like, this could be something, you know? And she's like, this villain has to have a personality. He has to have a motivation. He has to have all this stuff. And I was like, I think he shouldn't. Right. I yeah. really yeah. think yes. that that is the, point of this and it will make him a little different. We can always add stuff onto him later, which is what did happen when he was a popular character. <laughs> but Jeanette, let us do it. She trusted that the heart of their original idea was something that they would actually imbue with heart and it worked out so great. I'm glad you I'm glad you uh, I'm glad you stuck to your guns on that one because um, the thing that for me makes Doomsday such an effective device for killing off someone as iconic as Superman is that um, he is not explicitly, he's not explicit. He's just elemental. Right, right. And, and if really, if Luther had killed Superman, everybody would have known, oh, he's just going to get out of this. Because he always gets out of it with Luther. Nobody had ever seen Doomsday meet Superman before, so it could be anything. And I, I will say, if the marketing guys did anything on this project, it was once the sales orders were coming in and they saw how huge this was getting, everybody got scared that our return to life in Adventures 500 was gonna not going to be big enough. And they were totally right. And then we said, okay, we, we're going to have 
Oh, and we can be in another meeting though for that. But the reason. first thing they did was they said, because of the way comic books are ordered these days, if we are soliciting Adventures 501 or whatever, Superman 68 or whatever the number was, 78, everyone will know that Superman's coming back. Because, but they didn't even buy the issue where he died yet. Right. So we stopped publishing Superman for two months, three months, mm -hmm. right? yeah. three months, and that actually convinced everybody that maybe we were crazy and <laughs> we were going to leave Superman dead. And it was like, and I was like, that's such a great idea. And I was sitting there saying, oh, thank God, three months off. This is going to be a party. <laughs> but meanwhile, then Paul Levin says, there's no three months off. You have to do Newstime magazine. You have to yeah. do specials and miniseries and all this. And I was like, uh, I want to add, oh, I hope you don't work here someday. I have to add a, a quick <laughs> anecdote. One of the things that um, I remember at the time when we were discussing this was the idea of previews and having a cover image or whatever and given, basically giving it away. And I remember bringing up, because I was around when Byrne had done the relaunch of Superman, and I was getting some, <clears throat> I was getting photocopies and things from uh, Andy Helfer of what Byrne was doing in pencil. And one of the things that stuck with me was the fact that it was the only time, at that point it was the only time in recent history where a reader didn't know what Superman was going to be. And there was a panel in, it was just, as a result of a bad Xerox that Helford made that made it indicate that Superman's costume or something might have been different. And I remember thinking that, that this opportunity with having him dead was also like another opportunity. Don't lose this one because no one knows what he, if he comes back, what he's going to look like or any of that. It's a time to play up all the secrecy and all the mystery of it. Like he, you know, in a way that it was done beautifully with like having multiple guys, you know. Well, that but was something where you, as a writer, had an idea of what you wanted to do. Easy had an idea of what yeah. she wanted to do. Carl Kiesel, who was coming in uh, on Adventures, had his idea of what he wanted to do. Right. And Stern had an idea, and Dan had an idea, and everybody had a different idea. And Weezy was the one who said to me, I was like, I think this is going to be hard to pick the right one. Right. We, will, we don't know what would be the right answer. We all know, we hope that they could all be. But Weezy said, why don't we do all of them? And, and I said, them. let's kill them all. And it was like, it was so, it was such a relaxing, freeing idea. Oh, yeah. Because everybody then, in their own titles, would get to do their own thing that fit a story, but was uh, at least something unique to their title. But it felt, it felt competitive. It yeah, felt competitive too. I was, I was, it was my last meeting at that, when they were deciding that. But it felt like the competition between the four teams, the four books, as to which one all, you know, which one's going to really be Superman. Before it was decided that they would use them all. It actually, as a reader, I felt like it fostered a competition between each team to do their best to convince the reader that this is the one who's going to be Superman, you know, and that, as a, again, as a reader, purely, I, I enjoyed that aspect of the story because you could see each of these, everybody was at their, at, you know, at their most competitive, and I think they're, you know, you got a really good result out of it. And I do think, I think we came up with a great way to make each character unique and different and more. Or Superman is a different flavor, and Steel. I mean, Steel and Superboy, the fact that they ran for you know, almost 100 issues on their own and are still players of the DC Universe, is like a real testament to how cool they each would have been. But it would have been a sucky world if we had to actually pick one and only do that one. Because I think that it was, it, it's, it was a bigger idea to go big. So we convened this se separate, <coughs> sudden secret meeting. And the most surreal thing that ever happened to me was we had this meeting. And it was ended, and I went back to my hotel room and I put on the news, and on the news they were saying, DC Comics is having a secret meeting to bring back Superman. <laughs> you know, and their angle was that, see, they're listening to us. We always were going to bring him back. Right. We all had jobs that involved having Superman. <laughs> he was never going to go away forever. <laughs> so it's like, but that was bizarre to actually be news when all we were doing was working on comedy. <laughs>
was very strange. And then the, it, the fact that I don't know if we could pull off the reign of the Superman nowadays with the internet no, as the be pervasive done. as it is. Even when we showed the silhouettes of the four Superman characters and didn't show the characters, it's like that was the first time they was like they were playing up the secretness of it. And today there would be a leak. Or something would oh, no, you'd have people tell you how they already hated it before they even saw it. <laughs> or one of the artists would have posted it on like Facebook. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Let's not do that. Here's the latest page I just did. Oops. <laughs> oh, here's a quick question I want to throw back to you. There's so many iconic images when you come to comic books, and particularly when it's the death of a superhero. We'll have the George Perez cover from Crisis where he's holding Supergirl. And you think that's the most unique image in the world, but then when you do some historical fact checking, you notice that you've seen that image done again and again, and there's always an eye opener. I'm like, wait a second, Batman's holding Robin's limp body. Oh wait, that's not from the death of the family. They did that years ago in the 60s, and that cover, but... That was my favorite story. <laughs> Which one? Robin dies at dawn. Robin <laughs> dies at dawn, exactly, right? But the, the, the imagery that stands out in my mind 20 years later is when I think of the death of Superman, there's that shot, and you guys can tell me where they came from and what was your reference photos and how you came about it, but there's Lois, holding Clark's dead body, and you know, the Catholic boy in me is thinking, La Pieta, that's Mary holding Jesus, that's the first thing I'm thinking of too. Then there's part of me that's the famous Kent State shooting scene where the girl's standing over the body of the young man who was gunned down by the, the troopers. What was your thinking going on to draw an image that would be impactful without words that the reader could see and go, bang, that's it. Was there some type of thing you were looking at? Yes, it was the fact that we had made the decision to have it be a double page spread that folded up to a triple page <laughs> oh, spread. Yeah. Which meant it was a horizontal this, image. The, that's true. Yeah, and that and there was, was an animated action to it. Yeah. yeah. Which is never, you know, in all the omnibus editions they have done, and there's a brand new uh, hardcover Death of Superman that just came out like this past week. Bye, they, have, they have never <laughs> redone the fold out. The fold out. Which is really too bad because that's how that's why it was drawn that way. It was a double page spread that you then opened up to be a triple H triple page spread, which meant it's a very horizontal, you know, image and that means while Superman's laying out and Lois is holding them, that's just what's that's gonna what fit on the page. Right? Right. But meanwhile, I, I think actually that this image is the yeah. image that everybody yeah. thinks of. Yeah. And honestly, I can't believe that I didn't say we have to show his body. It's so easy you to know say, what, this is great, Better. but it so was here's, a great idea. So here's part two of the story. We did like probably four or five cover sketches for that, and that's the one that got picked. And all the other ones did have yeah. like Superman in silhouette or the dead body or something like that. So about uh, eight, nine months ago when um, we had a conference out in Burbank, mm -hmm. and no, this was a previous one, but... DC was having kind of a, a symposium on covers and trying to teach new talent how to do covers and everything. And so Mark Chiarello had everybody there and he's going through all these great cover images from both Marvel and DC, the yeah. history of comics, what works, what doesn't. And that one kind of came up and he said, you know, we can, we would never do this now. It would, it, we would be showing Superman's body Same. laying in the yeah. cement. Yeah, yeah which is that. The thing is we got to do Superman laying in the cement when we yeah. had the cover with yeah. Jimmy Olsen's photo, right. which was Tom Grummet's cover. Right. And it was like, the best thing you can learn from this is that if you can't do something you want to do one day, you get another day. There's always yeah. a place where you can get to some of these great ideas, or some of even the obvious ideas, but do it in an interesting new way. Yeah. But don't you think it's terrible to have somebody tell you you couldn't do that nowadays? Why well, would they put a limitation on yeah, it? Yeah, I don't it's think true because back then Mike never ever said you can't do that. Right. Well, and I, <laughs> I actually think that if you sent in five cover sketches and one of them was this to Mark, he would he would say I can't do this before you did it. But once he saw it, he might yeah, actually I say agree with you on that. Yeah. He that's might true. say, oh, I never would have let this go, but I really like it. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm gonna not let this go today. You're not allowed to do that. <laughs> and the the, the reality. You yeah, have three microphones, but that's in the Arlen Schumer room. That's another story. Um, the, the reaction, like you said, the folks were like, wait a minute, you're going to bring the character back? And like you said, you have to have jobs, so of course you're going to bring him back. But the immediate impact, and I think Jerry told me a funny story. It was it like, you, Mike Carlin, you were at some convention, and the guy came up to you and said, you killed Superman or something like that. Or he was really that happens angry. every day. No, <laughs> I go get gas. You think I killed Superman? No, but what, what was uh, okay? What was the most 
I don't know if it's the craziest reaction, but in general, were you the most disliked people on the streets of New York, or if somebody came up to you and like, why did you do that? Were they very passionate about what happened? A fan reaction? Well, I mean, people used to still write letters to comics back then, and we got a lot of nasty letters, that's for sure. I got death threats. Death threats? Over, yeah. I got death threats over Clark and Lois getting engaged. So you can imagine what was happening when we killed them. <laughs> it was, it, it, people were mad. We were taking away my childhood and all the stuff that the internet now has taken. And <laughs> it was like we had invented it somehow. And I'm sure that Marv got it when they killed Supergirl too. Yeah, there was a lot I think that. that there's a lot of that. We just tour around the world. We have friends in France who've gotten it. And we don't want to cause anybody any grief, but at the same time, the fact that you're reacting to that to some level at all is a testament to the work that has gone to make you love these characters. And you do, there's a point where you kind of have to trust that comics is a, is a long-term game. It's like uh, Supergirl is back, Superman is back, everybody's back. Is there anybody who has stayed dead, really? Uncle Ben. That's <laughs> Now the ideas out there. Derek's still dead. <laughs> Who's that? Did, um, Weezy, Weezy killed a, a, a... Oh, poor dead dog. Poor dead dog. Is the dead dog back. stay dead? Oh, he gets back every once in a while. Well, I don't know. He's, he's so entwined with Warlock, who knows? I can't keep track. Everybody, <laughs> everybody comes back. I everybody thought of one that didn't, Casper. <laughs> 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 well, they're, gonna, they're gonna do a grim and gritty Casper now. Death means death. <laughs> zombie, he's zombie Casper now. Where do we got like death on the mind? Casper versus zombie. Let's Casper. kill this guy. Let's kill Casper. That would be good. Let's no. kill Mitch. Stop. <laughs> anyway, um, again, going back to the reaction, you were getting death threats and then did you just stop saying, "Hey guys, it's just a comic book. Keep it easy." Well, the, the, the other reaction was that I I did a billion. TV interviews. I was on all kinds of news shows and, and Entertainment Tonight, which doesn't cover comics anymore now that the Kardashians are out there. <laughs> <laughs> the super villains of our universe. <laughs> and, but it's like the people were really, they really bought into this and we were really just surprised that people honestly believed it. And I admit we did a couple of moves to kind of make it look like we meant it. At the same time, it's like, it, it's just, these are serialized Movies, you know, at the end of the movie serials you go see in the 40s, it would look like the characters died at the end of every episode, but then they'd come back and show you some fake way they got out of whatever trap they were in. And it was like, it just was an accepted thing about action-adventure stuff, and it's like, it, it, it was stunning to us. And if I think we did anything at all right, it was that we didn't drop the ball once everybody was looking at us. And everybody, the spotlight was on us, and we... We, we managed to surprise people, and that just doesn't happen in our business anymore, thanks to the internet and news channels and all that kind of stuff. Well, and, and you got, obviously you're still DC, Dan's doing stuff every week, every month, you can get the books, everybody's still working on characters, John, and every, Gary, everyone's been doing it. But looking back in the last two decades, I'm sure you keep abreast of all the Superman stories that have been there, and you can ask the fans out here too, is there any story